Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our daily Dhamma talk. I was thinking today about confidence. How confidence can mean so many different things, or the, the, the qualities associated with confidence. It can be of uh, quite a varied nature, some wholesome, some unwholesome, some perhaps neither. But really, you could say the same about many, uh, many dhammas, many qualities of mind, or or perhaps not not qualities of mind, but many terms. It's the problem with language. It's the problem with language, and it's uh, the imprecision of of words. Because the word confidence, for example, refers to a number of associated mind states. Mind states that are qualities of mind that arise together or arise in sequence. And so it's important with all of these concepts um, take the five mental faculties, for example, confidence, effort, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. Okay, so you know what these five are. But taking confidence as an example, all five of them can mean quite different things depending how you understand the word and can actually become problematic as a result. Uh, the greatest problem for these is, comes especially when we try to develop one of them. And so th this idea of balancing the faculties is quite important f for this reason specifically. Because in trying to cultivate one of them, we, we misunderstand the, the nature of it. and It's very easy to get caught up in the wrong kind of confidence. All five of these, or, or the four of them anyway, besides mindfulness. And they require a very um, specific, uh, specific sort of development. I mean, they really require mindfulness. They require to be developed alongside the other faculties, but most especially mindfulness, or what we call mindfulness. And again, Misunderstanding of the word mindfulness can be problematic. So let's start with confidence. Confidence is so powerful. I think you could argue that's one of the big reasons why America has a very, very strange sort of president right now. You could argue with political figures in general, why they become elected is quite bizarre sometimes. I mean, there are other reasons, of course. There's a lot of technical reasons and rigging elections and that kind of thing, but there's this specific type of confidence that knows no shame. It's not even quite confidence, but it's a, a sense of self-assurance and it's common I think to psychopaths or sociopaths and enlightened beings enlightened beings are completely self-assured you couldn't criticize an enlightened being and make them feel the slightest bit embarrassed 
guilty, disturbed, upset. You can bring up things from their past, and an enlightened being would uh, would be unperturbed by that. But there's of course a great difference. The enlightened being would acknowledge and completely accept like Sariputta, for example. There's a story of Sariputta. He was... Uh, he slighted... Uh, unknowingly, he slighted some monk, and some monk got very angry at Sariputta and developed a grudge against him. And so one day Sariputta was walking, and the corner of his robe touched this monk as he walked past him. He just brushed past him, and the corner of his robe just touched him. And this robe went and... Uh, told the Buddha, or went around telling people that Sariputta hit him. And uh, so they came to the Buddha and they brought Sariputta, the Buddha called Sariputta and they came before the Buddha. And the Buddha said, well Sariputta, this monk says you hit him. The Buddha's not even going to ask him, you know, did you hit him? Because it's absurd, of course. And Sariputta says, well, you know, for one who has any attachment to the body or any sort of ego about self in regards to this body, it's quite possible that they could strike someone with the body. But he said, for me, this body is like a carcass hanging around one's neck. It's like, imagine there were, there were a young man or a young woman who was fond of adornment and dressed in fine clothes and jewelry, and then you would take a carcass of a dog and sling it around their neck. What would you, what would you, how would they think? What would they think of that? So that's how I view the body. I no attachment to the body whatsoever. It's a burden that I have to carry and care for. It's a sore with nine open wounds the nine holes of the body that are oozing uh, all sorts of foul substances you can count the nine holes if you like another time uh, the people came to the monastery and they brought sweets some kind of uh, pastries I think and everybody, every monk caught one there was one pastry for all the monks, each monk. So each monk took one pastry. Sariputta was at the head, and sitting in the uh, om, the dana sala, the, the kitchen, the dining room, I guess. And uh, everybody ate one pastry at the end of their meal. It was sort of a luxury. And I know all the meditators here are thinking, oh, pastry. Don't bring up food to meditators, it becomes quite a difficult situation because they've all been fasting since the morning. Honestly, eating once a day is not that big of a deal. But it's easy to get attached to food. And so the last one, uh, all the, all, there, was, there was a monk missing. All the, all the monks got one, but there was one left over because one monk hadn't come back from alms room. And he was usually late, maybe, so the monk said, well, you know, he's, he's not coming, or you know, he's probably gone to eat somewhere else. So they took the last one and they gave it to Sariputta. They said, Venerable Sir, you eat it. Don't let it go to waste. Because, of course, they respect Sariputta very much. And Sariputta looked around, and, well, the other monk wasn't coming, and so because they were urging him to eat it, he ate the last one, and just as he was eating it, this last monk shows up. And immediately Sariputta goes to him and says, look, or sitting where he is, maybe tells him, he says, there was one left over and uh, I ate it. It was supposed to be for you, but uh, I ate it. And this monk looked at Sariputta and he said, oh, wow. Well, you know, we all have a sweet tooth. Or you can't help it if you have a sweet tooth. Completely blaming Sariputta as though Sariputta somehow was greedy for it. It's totally snide and, and terrible remark to accuse.
cues an enlightened being like that, but Sariputta's response, it's quite touching. He, he made a vow. He vowed from that day forward never to eat pastry again. And so the monks from that time on would try to tempt Sariputta with pastry just to see, just to test him, because they'd heard that he made this vow never to eat pastry, and so they would bring a pastry to him. He would refuse to eat it. And so from that day forward to the rest of his life, he never ate pastry. There's another story of an arahant. There's lots of these stories. This, um, this uh, butcher was cutting up meat, and someone came and gave him a, a, a ruby. And he picked up the ruby, and he was looking at it, but his hands were covered in blood, and so he said, oh. So he put it down in a, in a tray, and he said, you know, look at it later, some precious gem. And then he went to the back of the room, Oh no, and then this arahant came to the door and, and he wanted to give food to the arahant. And so he went and he said, wait here, venerable sir, and he went back into the back room to, to get some cooked meat. And the arahant stood there at the door watching, and this bird who was, uh, up there, they had this pet bird in the, in the butcher shop, or maybe, yeah, some pet bird, went over and saw the ruby sitting in the dish covered in blood and thought it was a piece of meat and snatched it and ate it. The arahant watched this and didn't say anything, and didn't do anything, just stood silently. And then the man came back, and he was about to give the arahant some food, and he looked and saw the, uh, the ruby was gone. And there was no one else there except the arahant. Immediately he accused the arahant. And the arahant, rather than... So you, got this, so you, hear, you see this happen, and, and you think, well, why isn't he telling him? Why doesn't he tell him that this bird ate it? And the man starts beating this arahant and ties him up and starts beating him and pounding him and saying, where is it? Give, it? give me the ruby. And the arahant just takes all the abuse and he beats him almost to death and then the, he starts bleeding. The arahant starts bleeding and dropping blood on the floor. And this bird, seeing the blood, waddles over and starts starts drinking, lapping at the blood maybe, or, or pecking at it, I don't know. And uh, the, the butcher, seeing this, gives the bird a, a, a swift hit and kills it. And the arahant, lying bloody on the floor, turns and sees the dead bird and says, turns and sees the bird and says, is it dead? He said, he said yeah, the, the butcher says, yeah, the bird's dead and you're next. And the arahant said, the, the bird ate the ruby. Immediately he, he, he tells him what happened, right? Because if he hadn't, the bird would have died. He would have killed the bird. But now that the bird was dead, he was free to tell him. And the butcher cut open the bird, and sure enough, there was the ruby. I don't think that butcher went to a good place when he died. Confidence, lots of different kinds of confidence. Confidence can be dangerous. Okay? Confidence is not always a good thing, but it can be so powerful. People respect you, look up to you. In society, it's the confident ones that are with all different types of confidence, all different sorts of confidence. It's interesting to see how politicians can be taken down with just the slightest um, accusation. And other politicians can have mud slung at them and they never flinch because they're so confident and they just, they don't react. They seem impervious to it. There's some greatness to confidence. But such greatness can be abused, and it can be used for wrong purposes. So for meditators, not to stray too far, but clearly this is a problem for a meditator. A meditator will experience any number of any number of pleasant experiences. Uh, any number of 
attractive phenomena and can become quite attached to them you know, can can cultivate such powerful mind states that they become intoxicated by them so with too much confidence if the meditator is prone to un uh, non-reflective or, or unthinking unheedy as Shakespeare would say unheedy uh, confidence then they'll just follow whatever when, when strange experiences come they will encourage them when the meditator starts to experience rapture of all sorts their body shaking back and forth crying, laughing when energy comes the meditator becomes quite confident and just follows after it becomes enmeshed and, and caught up and can drive themselves crazy I've seen meditators drive themselves crazy with without proper guidance not my students I've never had a student go crazy but I've seen other people's students who didn't have quite the best guidance uh, get into quite mental quite a bit of mental difficulty I spent four nights in a mental hospital with a woman who uh, had become temporarily insane through the medit through her meditation practice and so instead of being mindful, like seeing, seeing, she would say, wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. All sorts of crazy mantras that she used. It's important to temper your confidence with wisdom. If you try to cultivate confidence, it can lead you astray. It's, it, it is influenced by our other mind states, by defilement. Effort. The second one is effort, equally problematic. If a person cultivates too much energy, too much effort, it can be a cause of great um, distraction, diversion. It can even lead to, and it can encourage the sort of temporary insanity I was talking about. Had one meditator with so much energy, she just got up and ran around the monastery. Couldn't she said she couldn't even stop herself. Other meditators, if they practice too much walking meditation or they push themselves too hard, walking, sitting, walking, sitting without taking breaks, can lead to great mental stress and wind you up. It can lead to problems in your practice. It's important, effort is an important one, easy to misunderstand. If you think of effort, the word effort or energy, we think is some kind of exertion, right? You push yourself. The energy, effort, exertion in Buddhism is it's quite uh, strenuous and energetic, but it's not really about pushing yourself, except pushing yourself to be mindful, right? Not pushing yourself to walk more, sit more, not pushing your mind to be free from defilements, stopping, preventing the defilements through sheer force of will. There are four great efforts. Effort is to remove and prevent unwholesome states from entering the mind and cultivate and keep wholesome states in the mind. That's it. We work in that way. It's quite a meticulous and sort of delicate um, act or, or, or work that we do. It's not just about barreling ahead like an ox. It's quite delicate. It's sort of a fragile sort of effort that you cultivate at every moment. Keep your mind bright. Make your mind bright in the moment. Make your mind clear in that moment. The effort to do that now, 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 each moment. That's the right effort. And when you say to yourself, rising, and you're aware of the rising, you have right effort. You have everything there, really. It's very easy to misunderstand effort and push too hard, dangerous. 
concentration as well samadhi samadhi is an interesting word samadhi means it's probably where they maybe where we get the word same from it's the same sort of idea as samma so what it means is to have things balanced or focused right like this camera you have to focus easy to go out of focus and then gave a talk on Monday and I pushed the button and when it complete it went completely out of focus so we often translate it as concentration but concentration has such a specific um, quality to it, right? Concentration is to fix your mind on one object, which is sort of what we're talking about, but it becomes very heavy, where you exclude you know, reality, where you force your mind by sheer force of concentration, we would say, ignoring everything else, not paying attention to anything else, keeping your mind fixed and focused on one object which is a valid sort of concentration, but it's not the sort of concentration that allows you to see impermanent suffering and non-self. You can't see the three characteristics. And you can't see the nature of reality because your mind isn't focused on reality. It's focused on whatever concept you've taken as the object, right? Only concepts can be the object of such concentration. You couldn't fix your mind on a reality because they're born and die in a moment you say I'm going to concentrate and fix my mind steadily on a single reality you'll be lost in the dust when it's gone in a, in, in a finger snap this reality is momentary so what we mean here is focus it's when you're clearly focused and aware and fixed on reality for the moment that it arises each moment like being in focus when you're in focus you can see it's this quality of mind that is not distracted not uh, not superficial the mind that deeply penetrates that moment just for a moment and then the next moment So again, it's very much tied up with mindfulness, all of these. This is why you can't really say, I'm going to cultivate them apart from mindfulness. Okay, we'll do mindfulness, but also on top of that, I'm going to cultivate confidence or effort. You end up cultivating the wrong sort of confidence and effort and concentration. And even wisdom. To think that you could cultivate wisdom outside of, um, of mindfulness, of sati like the talk, talking about this last night, the word wisdom is of course laden with all sorts of specific qualities that are not exactly what we mean by when the stomach rises, know that it's rising. When you see, know it just as seeing. Dite dite matang bhavisati. The Buddha taught bahia. Let seeing just be seeing. That's banya. That's what we mean. So again, completely tied up with sati. As for sati itself, we translate it as mindfulness, but the word mindfulness has a lot of baggage of its own. You can be mindful of a person's feelings, you can be mindful of the time, you can be mindful of what you're doing. In the sense that it means sort of a carefulness, conscientiousness, or an attention different things I suppose, sometimes attention, sometimes conscientiousness but sati doesn't really mean that, I mean it, it has these qualities to it but it really means to remember, sati means to remember yourself it means to have your mind on the experience, on reality 
happens, what, how reality works is we'll, we'll see or hear or smell or taste or feel or think, and then we're off, we're gone. The seeing occurs and then we get lost in it. Not in it, not in the seeing, but in what we think about it. We saw something and then, oh, that was nice, what was that? How can I get that back? I wonder what that meant. Did that mean something? Is that the path to enlightenment? <laughs> Maybe if I see it again, then I'll become enlightened. Maybe if I try to make it come, then it will. You'd be surprised at how many meditators get caught up in these things that they see, for example. Easy to get lost. Easy to lose your way. But we do this. This is na the nature. I was teaching today, teaching meditation today at McMaster at the Indigenous Studies Center. Just a few people. They tried to organize a bunch of people. There ended up being four of us. Um, but the, the head the head woman, she she asked, you know, if I if I say pain, pain, won't, won't the pain get worse? So I had to explain to her that pain isn't really the problem. There's a difference between pain and disliking. And disliking is what causes us suffering. So mindfulness is remind, rem, reminding ourselves and remembering. Remembering the, the actual experience. Instead of getting caught up in extrapolation, papancha, which we also talked about recently. So again, very simple, very simple qualities of mind. Not something you have to diversify. You don't have to really analyze. You don't have to analyze, it. do I have enough of this or enough of that? You have to use mindfulness. And when you use mindfulness, they will balance out by themselves. The five faculties. They will come part and parcel to mindfulness, to sati. When you're clearly aware of things as they are objectively, all of the all of the sorts of confidence, effort, concentration, wisdom that are not part of the path, and and especially the problematic ones, they'll 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 be weaker and they'll become weaker and weaker through your practice because you'll see you'll see how they're causing you stress and suffering or at the very best, how they're, how useless they are, meaningless, pointless. So, for this reason, the Buddha focused especially on mindfulness. He gave it, said many, many talks about mindfulness and coined the, the term the four satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness as the ekaya namanga, the manga, the, the path, the one-way path, or the one path. So good for us to reflect on these things and to see, and good to watch out for them. If you see yourself getting confident, overly confident, or too much effort, too much concentration, too much thinking and wisdom, you know, sort of conventional wisdom, you can note them, you know, apply mindfulness to them, you know, to judge them or get rid of them. But bring yourself back on track so that you're mindful even of them and, and not clinging or following or encouraging them. Then we can continue on with our cultivation of what really matters is sati. So there you go. There's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in.